those are trustees that have um, uh, was there doing that, and I know um, Randy Randy Book out, and my brother Ronnie Martin, and a bunch of guys been mowing and cleaning over there, and um, just thank you for all that you've done. Just appreciate our deacons and their leadership that they've given in that as well, and so I do appreciate all of you in the church. I speak on behalf of the church. We appreciate you as well. Um, I do have some prayer needs before we, uh, or as we worship this morning together, that I got some messages this morning, so I want to give you some updates. Um, the nephew of Miss uh, Lily and Howard Choate, um, Dole Talent. Uh, many of you may know Dole. Dole is at Park West Hospital. He's on the ventilator. I uh, went in for a hernia surgery and is not doing well. They weren't able to do that, and some infection has got all over the place and so we want to lift him up to the Lord in prayer here in a moment but um, be in prayer for him and his family uh, Miss Trish Lawhon is also uh, I don't know if she's come home yet I'm still waiting to hear back from her I think she's home from Blunt but she's dealing with some diverticulitis so just be in prayer for her Miss Connie Gardner who's not with us this morning she's dealing with um, several things one her sister Judy Walker who we've been praying for she passed away so keep her family in your prayers and then also just dealing with um, that infection and just the RA that she's dealing with is not doing well. I was talking to Jerry again this morning. Um, so we want to lift her up to the Lord and continue to pray for uh, Jake, uh, Jerry and Peggy Howe and their family uh, as they uh, bury Cody um, a Friday. And so uh, lots to be praying for as a church family. I know um, many Many of you are dealing with, with hurt as well. And so we need to be praying for one another. We wanted to bring these needs uh, before you. And so uh, as we worship this morning, we just want to lift up um, these to the Lord this morning. So if you would join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you and we do praise you that you're our Father. We thank you that you've brought us into this relationship by the perfect work of your Son, Jesus. And him coming and living the perfect life and dying the death that we deserved and then rising again that glorious third day. Giving us victory, Lord. We thank you. Thank you that we can come now into your presence, holy and acceptable before you because of the righteousness of Christ that has been applied to our lives, Lord. And so we thank you and praise you again. And Lord, you know we're a needy people and we have many in our church family and extended family, Lord, that are hurting this morning. And we thank the dull talent, Father. We pray, Lord, you, 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 you'll have to intervene in this situation, Lord. We know that uh, if it's your will, you can. You can heal if you so choose. And we pray that it would be. And we pray that you would be with the doctors and nurses that you use, Lord, and medicine, uh, your good graces to, to bring about that uh, if you so choose. And so we give him to you, Lord, and just encourage uh, Lily and the family. My friends, Lord, that are lifting him up, we come as corporately as a body to pray for him. And our other uh, sisters, Lord, and, and brothers that are hurting this morning, Miss Connie dealing with the loss of her sister and also sick, Father. Miss Trish Lawhon, pray that you would be with her and continue to comfort those who have lost loved ones, grandsons, of Jerry and Peggy, Lord. May you continue to strengthen their hearts, Lord, as they look to you. And, and we thank you for the promise of the gospel, Lord. The hope that is ours in Christ, that uh, though death come in so many different forms and ways that we die, Lord, that those who trust in you shall be with you. And so, Lord, we praise you. And so, Lord, as we corporately come this morning, that's what we want to do. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. So have your way, uh, Lord, as we continue to praise you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You're worthy of all of our praise and adoration. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I do want to read uh, from the Gospel Project's text this morning, two of the points um, it, that, you, that you, those that are in taking the Gospel Project, you saw that this morning, and it was so good. I just wanted to share Psalm 96. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there real quick. But we were made to glorify the Lord and to worship Him. Amen? Uh, because we are his image bearers, um, his glory is revealed through the worship of his people. And so just listen to Psalm 96 as we, um, 
as we continue to just prepare our hearts, I hope you've been preparing your hearts and prepare your heart when you come in. That happens during the week as you abide in the Lord and on Saturdays as well as you think about coming in and gathering with God's people to sing to him together, to give, to, to, to listen to God's word and ask God to speak to us uh, by his spirit through his word. Uh, listen to this psalm and then I'm going to pray. We're going to stand men, come down and we'll, we'll take up the offering um, and we'll worship through song. Worship through the word here. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. De Man, this is a message in itself. Amen. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is. He is. Amen. Amen. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord. O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. This is the promise and the mission. Ascribe to the Lord and the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. We don't come before the Lord flippantly. We come before him humbly and reverently. He is God. And he has brought us into his presence. Say among the nations, verse 10, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he who comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And he will do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are blessed. And so I'm going to pray and pray over this offering. And the men will come. We'll take up this offering and then as we sing together, um, we praise the Lord for how he has blessed us. We are so blessed richly. So the offering we give, we're just giving back to the king of kings. Amen. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We're just stewards of his here, right? And we want to praise him for the opportunity and the goodness that, uh, that he has bestowed upon us and given back to him. Uh, let's pray together and praise him together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you that you have saved us. May we rejoice and sing together this morning from our hearts and our minds, thinking about the truth of the gospel. May your Holy Spirit work inside of us, Lord, and, and has been, Lord. Thank you that you've been doing that and moving us to give this day as we set aside this day to raise the funds to pay for um, the loan next door. Father, we thank you for this opportunity and we thank you for the opportunity to give to you as an act of worship, Lord. So take these funds and Lord, uh, use them for the, the expanse of your kingdom, Lord. And so be honored, be glorified, Lord, this day amongst your people here at Bethlehem. I pray, Lord, as we continue to worship you and we go from here in a little while, we will say it's been good to be gathered together as the people of God to experience you and to experience fellowship in unity of the spirit and the worship and the praise of Jesus the King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come. Yeah, I invite you to stand.
So choir, y'all can come on up and uh, I'll invite everybody to stay standing if you will. But uh, choir, y'all can come on, y'all. Everybody sing with us. I'm gonna need y'all's help on this first one. Y'all hear me blow out or pass out or something. Y'all just keep going on. <laughs> Thank you. 
the Father's will. Amen. goodness is grace it seems like to me all of uh, all of the those lyrics go so well with what we um, know to be true of the Lord 
the lessons this morning in Sunday school, whether you were in here, or, uh, in the Gospel Project, going through Romans, or the Gospel Project as well. Then this morning, uh, when we look here at Paul's confession of pressing on hard after Jesus, listen to the word of the Lord, chapter 3, verses 12 to 16, where we'll be as long as the Lord will have us this morning. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Hey, yes. yeah. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Yeah. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Father, bless the reading of your word. May you be adored, and Lord, I believe you've been worshiped thus far through song and through giving, and now, Lord, through the reading of your word and the preaching of your word. We ask and we beg you that your spirit would lead us and teach us now to understand what you would have us to know, and how you would have us to live based on your word here from the Apostle Paul. So have your way in these next few moments, Lord. Continue to have your way for your good name's sake and for the good of your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's easy to think that the Apostle Paul was a super Christian. You ever thought that? Have you ever read the scriptures, read the epistles, all these letters, all these churches that the Apostle Paul has, by God's enabling, by his spirit, has planted and he's taken the gospel. This one man in particular has devoted his life to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Yes. Literally, that he knew at that time. That was his desire, is that Christ would be known and worshipped where he has not been known and he has not been worshipped. Yes. Amen. That should be the heart of every blood-bought yes. son Amen. and daughter of the king. Yeah. Is that your heart's desire? But if you're like me, if you're like others in this world as well, because it's not about me, but we tend to compare ourselves to other people, don't we? Yeah. We tend to compare ourselves individually to others in so many different areas of life, whether it's business, you're running a business and you look at someone who's running a business similar to yours or in the same field and and, well, you know, they're doing this here. Maybe I, you know, I should do this here. Jealousy can breed in in that way. Bitterness can breed in uh, or be bred from that. The generations, looking at the, the, the different generations of people, right? Uh, I'm pretty hard on the millennials, just to be honest with you, right? The generation ahead of me and a couple generations ahead of me, you're probably hard on me, right? And my generation, and rightly so, we begin to compare our generation and, and think, boy, if we were just more like this, we'd be all right. We, we, have a, we have a tendency in our fallenness to compare ourselves to others. And what happens inevitably is we look a little bit better than others, or, you know, we look a little bit worse, right? So we strive after being better than this person or this thing or, or this business. Uh, we do this in our states. We're, I think we're experiencing that. We go, you know, Tennessee, we're very conservative. Right? <laughs> People are moving here. They're moving in Florida. Yeah. Different places like that now. Right? Yeah. Why? Politically, there's so much political tension in the world. We begin to think, well, you know, we've got it all together. Our country... God bless America. Yeah. Yeah. God has blessed right. America. Amen. And the truth be known is we've turned our back upon it. Yeah. The church in particular. Yeah. 
is a mess, right? But the Lord is conforming his church into his image. And he's purifying things in a way that we can't see because we don't have that perspective. But we tend to compare our country to other countries. And are we better than other countries? In many ways, yes. In many ways, no. As far as freedoms that we experience, absolutely. You realize we're gathered freely in here. Worship. And we just got singing good truths together. Coming to the altar freely and praying. Bowing our hearts and our minds right where you're sitting and praying to the Lord and praising the Lord and lifting our hands when brothers and sisters in Christ in countless countries cannot lift the name of Jesus loud Amen. for fear of having their head chopped off or having their families then sought out and executed. We are blessed. Amen. We look at other countries, even as Americans, and say, hey, we're a lot better than those people. We've got to figure it figured out. We compare ourselves. We compare our churches. We look at other churches online, the media. Uh, the um, social media has been a big benefit. I'm not hammering that. But it also has its hindrances, right? Yeah. We listen to preachers online. We listen to these men, great men of the Lord, preach the word. And we hear some really bad preaching and teaching as well. And what inevitably do we do? I know what I do. I compare myself to these other preachers. Well, boy, I sure wish I could preach like that guy. Lord, why didn't you, why didn't you give me a Scottish accent? Right? I love listening to guys with accents. Right? Until I was one in Canada. Right? And some of my Asian brothers said, man, you're a real life redneck, aren't you? I was like... Well, I guess so. I guess I am, right? <laughs> we compare ourselves and we look at and we listen to other preachers. Listen, the other preachers you listen to, they're not your pastor. They're not going to give an account for your soul, right? right? And those that I listen to, God has made me me. He's made you you. And every other church in this area is a local assembly of the Lord, little outpost of heaven, Edmund Clowney would say, yeah. little outpost of heaven in which God is taking a people and he's changing them for their glory. They may do things a little bit different, but as long as the word is central, as long as it's preached, praise the Lord. Yeah. Right? Paul talks about this early in this letter, right? Those that were jealous of him. Jealous of his ministry. Glad that he was chained up because now we can get a little bit of limelight now because Paul's the big dog, right? Jealousy. We are bad about comparing ourselves. In the scripture this morning, what we do see is the Apostle Paul described what an active, personal relationship with the living Lord is like. Yes. And what it isn't. And what having this personal relationship causes us to pursue Jesus even more. It causes us to, to seek him all the more. I have it there in your notes. Our trust in the Lord should always be active and dynamic. Meaning, it should always be moving us forward. You know what that means? We should be changing. Right? I'm not talking about stuff or programs in the church. I'm talking about us personally. Inside, our hearts should be being molded and shaped and conformed. We should be changing inside. And what inevitably happens is our actions then change. Amen. Our attitude changes. Our patience with others changes. It affects every area of our lives. So we should be moving forward in change in being more like someone else. No, like Christ. Simply, that, that's what it is. That's what it's all about. That's, give me more of Jesus. The, the one before, how deep the Father's love for him. When you pull it all down, that, that's what we need, right? That's what we need is more of Christ and less of me. Amen. And we misquote this passage often, but I understand the heart behind it. We say, you know, with, with John and his ministry, John the Baptist, he must increase and I must decrease. You heard that or read that passage there in John, Gospel of John? Well, what John was talking about in truth and in context was his ministry. His yeah. ministry must decrease because the Messiah is here now. And this very prophet of the Lord, John the Baptist, would end. Later on, I'll talk with a sister this Wednesday night. 
ended up with doubt. You know, doubt was that even the Messiah? He was the forerunner. Yes. The Lord is patient with that. He's patient with us. He loves us. Our pursuit of Him and striving after Him, He is the goal and He changes us into His image. Jesus is the goal of our life now, right? And forever. So let us consider this morning just a couple things on how to pursue Him. Number one, what you recognize here with Paul is he, he recognizes and he considers that he has not arrived at perfection. Look at verse 12. Not that I've already, already obtained this or am already perfect. So let's stop there. Not that I've already obtained what? What is his desire? His desire is to know Jesus. Go back up to verse uh, 10 and 11. Um, or or we'll go back up to verse 8. I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of what? Knowing Christ my Lord. His single devotion, his pursuit was to know Christ. That's got to be the pursuit of our lives. This is what he is getting at. This is what he is pressing us to know. For the sake, for his sake, Jesus' sake, suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish, garbage, in order that I may gain Christ. Be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through trust, faith, believing in Christ, the righteousness from God. That depends upon our trust in him. Amen? Amen. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, the partnership of his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection. So what does he not obtain? The resurrection from the dead. For the resurrection from the dead leads to a completion and a beholding of Christ for all of eternity, separated from the presence of sin. That's what we're after. Amen? Amen. That's what we're after. We're after Christ, to know Christ, to experience Christ. And in his day, the Apostle Paul's day, the Pharisees thought that they had reached perfection or that they could reach perfection. They thought that they... Uh, that heaven was now because they were perfect. They had kept the law. That's garbage. Amen. They didn't. They can't. Right? And they were blinded to that. Listen, some people's eyes are blinded. And even as Christians, listen, talking back about generations, every generation has a blind spot. Yeah. You know what I mean? No. You know what I can't see right now? What's behind me? Now I know that there's a baptismal back there. I think when I first got here, I didn't know for sure. You know why? Because there's this beautiful stained glass of a shepherd with the sheep there. And I didn't know that that thing's on rollers. And it slides right over. And there's a baptismal there. I can't see what's behind me. So guess what? I need the Spirit. I need the Lord. And I need you. And you need me. Every generation has blind spots. You look back in history. You look at, 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 at uh, George Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists. Look at a lot of these men. They own people. They own slaves. Right? Is that right? No. Right? No, that ain't right. Were they godly men? Yes. Did they have blind spots? Yes. And so it's easy to see those blind spots looking back when we turn around and we look at past folks. These Pharisees had a major blind spot. One, because they were trying to achieve righteousness, salvation, apart from faith in the finished work of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Right? Amen. But even as Christians, we can have blind spots as well. This is true in our day. TV preacher and false teacher, yeah. Kenneth Copeland. If you listen to this, uh, this man who needs the Lord. He preaches freedom from sickness and poverty. He would be preaching the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Yes. Right? Jesus wants you healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. And if you're not, it's your fault. You haven't exercised enough faith. You're not trusting the Lord enough. And I can help you with that, though. I'll send you a little something if you send me a little something. I'll pray a blessing upon you if you'll send me $1,000. Right? Don't be fooled by this foolishness and this wickedness for men who are after gain financially. He says this. This is what he proclaims. The world's shortages have no effect on someone who has already gone to heaven. 
If you've read books about 90 minutes in heaven, one, one, I, uh, I can't remember. I don't have it in my notes. I should have put it in my notes. Uh, he, he went to heaven. His last name was Malarkey. Yeah. I'll just leave that there. Some of you get it later. Kids will probably ask. Yeah. It's Malarkey me. Yeah. It's a, it's a Hebrew word for that. Bakar, Bakar. A whole bunch of bull. Right? Yeah. Just kidding. I don't know if that means that. I'm joking. The world shortages have no effect on someone who's already gone to heaven. Ain't nobody gone to heaven. Puzzle Paul couldn't even speak of all that he saw. Right? That's right, brother. He says this. Therefore, they should have no effect on us here who have made Jesus Lord of our lives. What is he saying? He's saying he's gone to heaven. He's perfect. It should have no effect on us here. Kent Hughes says this. The reality is the more we come to know Christ, the more we will come to sense our need to grow. And when we imagine that we have arrived, stagnation sets in. Yes. If the Apostle Paul had not arrived, we ain't going to arrive. Yeah. And he never arrived. You know why? Because he was just a man. Yeah. He was a sinful man, just like me and you. Just like me and you. But when we become complacent, we become stagnant, right? We become stagnant. Don't stagnate, brothers and sisters. It can happen real quick, right? I, I, I love fishing. I love going up the river and trout fishing in particular. And I love fishing in the lake too, catching some crappie and stuff. That's fun. Um, but going up the river is just, it's peaceful. And after a big rain, you got to wait a little while and gets the water all dirty. And boy, it just it flows and it goes in all the different crevices. And a few days later, after that rain stops, you go up there and you'll have these pools have all this old fresh water and just be sitting still. And it only takes a couple of days. And you go up there and you'll see like a film over the top of that stuff, right? Happens in places uh, South Georgia. It happens in, in like in ponds and, and rivers when the thing the tides go up and down, and you just get some stagnant water, right? Maybe experience that at the beach. You go to the beach and the tides come in, and then it leaves these little pools. And you walk in the walk in the, 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 the water there in the ocean, and it's you know it's a little cool. And then you walk over there, and that water is trapped in that pool, and it, it's is like hot, and it feels slimy, yeah. right? It's not healthy. It stagnates with time and it just stays and it's not being moved by another force. There's nothing moving it and changing it. As we pursue Jesus, he changes us. Yes. He pure. There's no complacency in the Christian life. There's no stagnation. We should always be being conformed into the image of Christ. And so how do we, how do we best not stagnate or become complacent? And it's simple. It's humility. It's humility. It's humbling ourselves daily in confession of our need for Jesus. What we sing here this morning, we live out each day as we pursue Christ. We receive God's grace daily as we confess our sins and our need for him. Amen. True. Not in order to be justified, but to be sanctified, to be changed more and more in his likeness. I'm going to move on. Second point. Not only do we, uh, not only do we recognize that you haven't arrived, we are not a completed work. We're not done. We're a work in progress. <laughs> Quick story. Uh, a friend of mine, Old Testament prof, he told me that on his tombstone. You know what he wants? He told his wife he wants on there if he goes first. He said, I want you to put on my tombstone, tombstone um, or gravestone. We call it tombstone anymore? Yeah. Gravestone. <clears throat> Making progress. <laughs> making progress because really in heaven you know we arrive there yes we're separated from the presence uh, of sin forever but we get to behold God the infinite God forever we learn more and more about him forever you're not going to go there and just have a complete knowledge of everything you realize that right no you're going to grow more and more in your understanding of the sovereign and supreme creator of all things Jesus in particular who was made manifest to us. We get to see him and him alone. There will be no other gods. It will be the one triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus in flesh we will behold forever. Amen? That's what we're after. So, 
Not only to recognize that, but we remember that the Lord, Paul remembered this, that the Lord has sought him out. The Lord has sought you out and he has saved you. He has set his affection upon you in your. We know the passages, right? We know the scripture in Romans at the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. You were dead in your sin and Christ Jesus died for you. Amen. Even before there was a day that you were here, the Lord did that so long ago. So remember that the Lord has sought you out and he has saved you. Never forget that. Never forget that. Never forget that he has rescued you, reconciled you, redeemed you back into his image positionally. He's adopted you into his family. That's why adoption is such a beautiful picture of the gospel. Paul never got over this. Ever. Are you over it? Are you over your first love? Are you over that love that you experience whenever that is? I, I don't know that for each of your lives. Many of you have heard your testimonies. I'm getting to know and you share when God opened your eyes to the gospel and saved you. Don't ever get over that. Amen. That should never get old to us. That's why we preach the gospel to ourselves and we remind ourselves. We see this in Ephesians. This is why Paul just goes off there in chapter one of Ephesians. And he's telling the Ephesians church for three chapters who you are. Listen, we don't need to be told what to do all the time as a church. We need to rest in who we are in Christ and then go live in light of that. Amen. Right? What are you saying, Zad? I'm saying before we are to be doing, we are to be being. We are to be a disciple before we will be a disciple who makes disciples. We are to be with the Lord and abide with the Lord daily. We'll talk about that here in a minute. I believe Paul understood that. I'm not going to read all of this text for you. Read Ephesians 1. He adopted us. He's lavished grace upon us. Riches and inheritance. Everything that is ours. I, I've been singing this song lately. I heard it. We heard it at the men's conference. It's, it's uh, written by a, a lady named Charity Gale. I don't know a lot about her, but I just want you to listen to these lyrics. Paul never got over the divine exchange that happened. Christ taking his sin mm -hmm. and Christ's righteousness being placed upon his account. Amen. And the account of all, all those who trust in him and believe upon him. Listen to this. On the cross hung my pain. And the guilt and the shame. Jesus bore my suffering to the grave to make me free. Oh, the blood that was shed. It now flows to cover sin. It washes clean and purifies. And it's healing crimson tide. And then this poor chorus. Jesus, he took my place in divine exchange. Hallelujah, grace is mine. Now I will live by faith for the one who saves. He gave all to give me life. His spirit is my present help. I'd be lost all by myself. He resurrects. He sanctifies. He takes his power and he makes it mine. Yes. And then goes into a, a refrain. I lay down all lesser things for greater gain. He is alive inside of me. I lay down all lesser things for greater gain. Yes. Christ is greater gain. I believe the Apostle Paul, this is exactly what he did. Believe and experience. This is what we experience. But we, if we're honest, we compare ourselves to others. We look for things in this world to satisfy us. Bigger house, thicker carpet, bigger car. All these different, are those bad things? No, no. Is it wrong to have a big house? No, it's not wrong, right? God blesses us to be a blessing to other people, to use the resources we've been given to be a blessing to others and to encourage others to pursue Jesus. It's not the things, folks. It's our hearts. Our hearts are little idol factories, one reformer would say. And he's exactly right. We make things idols in our lives. When the one supreme thing, that the only thing, the only person that will satisfy us is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. And if you're trusting in anything else to try to satisfy the desires and the longings of your heart, you are sadly mistaken, according to thus says the Lord. Amen. Trust in Jesus. No joy. No the goodness of God daily as you pursue him. So how do we pursue Jesus daily? That's a great question. I love y'all. You ask great questions. You got it there in your notes. Number one, by having daily communion with Jesus. There it is. This is earth shattering. 
And if you can't read, God understands that. Come talk to somebody. Talk to me. Boy, I'll get you an audio book. We'll get stuff set up. We're prayerfully reading his word. That's how you pursue him. Have communion, abiding in Christ. The Gospel of John talks about this. Abide in me and I will abide in you. By prayer, by praying, reflecting, and meditating on Christ and his word daily. By denying yourself and taking up the cross, your cross each day. And by making war against your sin. We have to deny ourselves. We have to take up the cross and follow him. Remembering the gospel, preaching the gospel to ourselves will provide for us a determination we need to press on to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. It will. It will. So now look at verses 13 and 14 and notice. Notice the tone here that there's an intensity that happens. Not that I've already obtained this. And I'm already perfect, but I, I press. There's an intentionality. There's an activeness. I press on to make it my own because Christ made me, me his own. Brothers, I do not. It's very personal. I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I press on. I strain forward to what lies ahead. One thing I do. This single sentence right here, it draws from uh, the metaphor of a race, a foot race. And it, it's in the, it, this is important, it's in the, it's in the present tense, right? In, in the past tense, it's in the present tense. But with these clauses that follow, and you'll see these, I want you to see these clauses. Look at it. The past, forgetting what lies behind. The future, what does it say? And straining forward to what lies ahead. And then the present, I press on toward the goal. It's a picture of, in, of, of running a race with focus and intensity. There's, a, there's an intentionality to what Paul is talking about here. What he is communicating to us. A focus, an intensity. And we fix our eyes on the prize. Not the things of heaven. But the one from whom, whom heaven has all glory. The lamb provides the sun in heaven. Yes. The, the goal, the, the yellow tape that that runner is running towards. What Paul is straining after. What we together are linked up in arms, pressing on and running together is Jesus. He is the one we're running after. So what do we need? We need resolve. Look what he says. Resolve to do one thing, run after Jesus and to take hold of him. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's pressing, he's straining, he's running. One thing you don't see about the you know, Olympics, you look at the Olympics and you see those runners, they're not sitting here looking around and all that, right? <laughs> they're, not, they're looking to see. One of the worst things you can do when you're, you're getting close is look like this right here, right? It's got to fly real back, right? I would dare. I don't know how many of y'all runners in here. I can't run like that, right? Those guys are trained. They've been training themselves, and that's what we do. We train ourselves for godliness, for holiness, right? And we focus on the on the on the prize. And so, you think about these: the past, the future, and the present. Paul says, "Forget the past." He has a he has a sanctified forgetfulness. I, I was trying to think of how to term this this week. He, he knows how to forget his past achievements, right? Think about all that he has done. He's planted churches. He's been shipwrecked. If anybody's going to boast of just pursuing Jesus with all his heart and life, the Apostle Paul is the one to do it, right? We read about this all over. He forgets the past. He could have boasted in all these things. But instead, he looks ahead. And not only, I, 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 was, I wrote this in my journal, looking back on our past too long will cause us to lose focus on the goal. It'll cause us not to be focused on being conformed into the image of Christ and cause us not to be obedient by making disciples who will make disciples. It'll, it'll, direct, it'll change our vision from the mission and the goal of Jesus. But not only does he forget his past achievements, 
This is what I think we're going to relate with. He forgets his past failures. Yes. Amen. You know, you're not defined by what you once did. In the past, even in the present, not in the future. You are defined by Christ. That's good. Amen. That's good, church. That's good based on God's word. Right? Don't look back. We don't trust Christ for salvation and just sit around and think about heaven. No, we've got a task to be, to, to be about and to do, and that is to be conformed into the image of His Son. We've been saved by works, but we're saved to work at whatever age level we are. Does that change for us? We're talking with some brothers, uh, Mr. Bill actually was telling me, he's like, man, wait till you get a little older. You start hurting a little bit more and more. And you know what? He's exactly right. And sometimes I think as I get older, like, well, I did that before. And I think this enters some of our thought life, maybe, right? Maybe not everybody. I don't know. I'm not mind readers, but I know what I see as well is, well, I did that. I, you know, now I'm getting older. It's time to just chill out and just sit. That's not right. Do our bodies change physically? Yes. Does the Lord know that? Yes. But how can you serve? What can you do for the Lord? One of the biggest things you can do, you know what you can do? As you get old, as you get older, is pray. Amen. Pray. Call. Encourage. The older ladies, take some of these younger ladies and be intentional with conversations about what it means to be a godly wife, about what it means to be a godly mama, about what it means to, to take care of a home. Do, do we need that men to take some of these younger men to be intentional, to tell them how to change a tire or some oil in a car, right? But teach them what it means to be a godly man and to submit to God's word. What does that take? Listen, where, whatever stage of life you're in, God is using you in that. He's not done with you. That's good news. Amen. Amen. That's good news. He, he wants ever. We, Bethlehem, is going to continue to grow and be a multi-generational church. Young little children that have trusted Jesus and learning about Jesus. Teenagers, college students, middle-aged, young adults, married couples, older married couples, mama, papa, we're all growing and we need one another to grow and mature properly. Yes. And so we forget the past, we forget past achievements, and we look forward. We resolve to move forward, and I have to move forward. The future, we forge ahead with courage and determination. One commentator says this, there's instruction for everyone here across the spectrum of age and experience. For those who have some miles on them, I love this, and are battle-worn. So I hope if you're older here this morning, what I, what I just said about being old and feeling like you, you know, I, don't, I don't view you as sitting on the sideline. That's not what I'm saying. But I want to encourage you. You're not on the sideline. God is using you where you're at. And many of you are great prayer warriors. Listen to this. Battle-worn. And perhaps have some striking accomplishment, accomplishments. God calls you to selective amnesia. So that you will not be lulled from your stride. For all young and old, do not look back. Lift up your eyes. Look straight ahead and focus. I read that. I was like, that's good right there. That's what we need to do. Young or old, we, we focus ahead, right? And we focus ahead on the present and our, our daily pursuit of Jesus. So, so lastly, we have to remain focused on the prize. Verses 15 and 16, we come to a close here. I've got an illustration on a story I want to share really, and we'll close. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything, in anything, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it, reveal that also to you, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let us who are mature think this way. What does he mean by that? Boil it all down. Hopefully real simple for us to understand is mature people recognize that they have not arrived and they humbly pursue Jesus with their whole life. Yeah. That's what they do. Those of us who are mature and we see others that don't understand that, what does it say? Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it, reveal that also to you. 
God will reveal it. What we need to be is an encouragement, build relationships with one another so that we can speak into one another's lives and help press people on to pursue Jesus solely. That is really good. God will reveal it. Yes. He'll do it through lives that are submitted to him and by the work of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. So what do we do? We trust him and we hold on to his word. Let us hold true to what we have attained. The word, the mature, those who think this way. There's no room to be passive in your pursuit of Christ. We have to give all our effort to the spiritual disciplines in our life. It's a whole other message. Holding to the standard of the word. I close with this. Some of our older folks will probably remember this. Young people, you ought to do it. You've probably never seen this movie, movie Chariots of Fire. Anybody seen that movie in here? Have you seen it? Eric Little, or Liddell, the flying Scotsman he was known as, was already famous when he made his phenomenal comeback to win the 440 race in Scotland, France meet. And his fame increased as a runner and as a Christian, especially at the Paris Olympics in 1924, where he refused to run in his best events, the 100 meters and the 4x100 relay, because they were ran on Sunday. That's some conviction. Chariots of Fire, however, inaccurately portrays this as a last minute decision in Paris. You've seen that movie? You picked that up, right? Whereas he actually decided well in advance and began to train for the 200 and the 400 meter races. Liddell took a prize, uh, took, took the bronze in the 200 and amazed the world by winning the 400 in the world record time of 47.6 seconds. Five meters ahead of the silver medalist, he was truly flying. Runner he was, but he was also one who manifested a devotion to Christ. In 1925, having completed his degree in science at Edinburgh and a degree in divinity, he set sail as a missionary to China with the China Inland Mission Agency. In 1932, during his first fur furlough, he married Florence McKenzie. In 1941, facing the growing threat of Japanese Occupation. He sent his wife and three daughters to Canada to stay with uh, her family while they stayed on to serve, while he stayed on to serve among the poor. Liddell suffered hardships, many hardships, but kept running hard after Christ. And then in 1943, he was uh, interned in the Wyhazen inter, uh, internment camp where he again cheerfully served those around him. In 1945, at the age of 43, so I share this story, I'm 43 years old, Eric Liddell died of a brain tumor that might have been caused by his malnourishment and overwork. Liddell's grave was marked by a simple wooden cross with his name written in boot polish. He was interned in a mausoleum of martyrs in a place in China, Chishajahong, China, I think is how you pronounce it, I did not know what the inscription says. But if I were to imagine one, it would be this. He died running here. Was a man, he who died here running was a man whose life was given to one thing. Forgetting what lie behind and straining forward to what lie ahead. He pressed on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God used my life. That's our desire. That's what Paul is saying here in this text that I've tried to explain in 32 minutes and 48 seconds. Press on to trust Jesus. May we all die running for Jesus. And know this, we will, we will lay hold of him one day. Why? Because he has laid hold of us in the gospel. Amen? Father, we love you. And we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you that you have laid hold of us through the perfect work, life of your son Jesus, and Lord, his resurrection from the dead, we one day will attain that. Help us together to lock arms, brothers and sisters in Christ, and run this race after you, Jesus, for your glory and the good of your great name and the good of your people here. We praise you, we thank you. Move in our hearts now, but through this week and encouraging us, Father. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
We'll have a time to just respond and worship uh, through song and so on.